and it's such a beautiful time of year. This is a time to reflect on the greatest love story ever told. It's a true story, a story of God's love for us in sending us a Messiah and Savior, His only begotten Son, Jesus. He was prophesied to be born of a virgin in a little town called Bethlehem. And God's people awaited this miraculous prophecy, and they were not disappointed. The angels announced, Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. Jesus continues to come to us today and is present with us, for he is Emmanuel, God with us. The Advent season is a time of waiting, as we know, and remembering, a time of preparation as well. And as we prepare our homes to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us also prepare our hearts in anticipation of the second coming. He said that he would come again, and so we wait as the chosen people before us waited in faith for the Messiah. And so this greatest love story ever told brought the greatest gift of love ever given for all time and eternity, the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, all grace and all mercy flows and pours forth to each believer and through each believer to call others to prepare the way for the Lord. At this holy time of year, as you consider your gift giving, I pray that you will give meaningful gifts of love and compassion, kindness and mercy, and words of faith to bring salvation to those who long for Jesus and who do not yet know him. These are the true treasures that can only come from the heart. And these are the forever gifts of love that only you can give. You are God's work of art. You've been created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that you should just simply walk in them. I pray that the gifts that you give at this holy Christmas time will be a reflection of God's love and that you will be mindful of the forever gifts of love that only you have the power to give. So I pray today that God would bless us all with great joy in this Advent season as we prepare for not only the celebration and remembrance of Jesus' birth at Christmas, but let us prepare our hearts for his second coming, for he will come again. And so let us invite him and say, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, come into our hearts, come into our hearts, come into our lives, come into our lives. Jesus for this day and this opportunity to be together. And we ask, Lord, that you will allow us to experience the presence, Lord, of your love for us through each other, Father. Let us know the power of your love. And so we thank you for this opportunity to be together. And I thank you, Lord, I thank you. And I ask that every heart might be healed today. And Lord, if you want to heal people with physical illness of any kind, emotional, spiritual, anything, Lord, and the things that we bring before you, Lord, we ask that you do that. For we give ourselves to you and just surrender ourselves into the ocean of your mercy. And I thank you, Father God, also for Father Mike Berry, our spiritual advisor. Lord, let us be open to hear your word spoken through him in the name of Jesus. And so we praise you, Lord, and pray always in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, yesterday, the tragedy in San Bernardino um, happened about two miles from our outplace near his table. And uh, so, um, a terrible thing. Really, it was a tragedy. And people, it spread like wildfire all over the place. There was 30 people killed. There was two bombs there, there was this, there was that. All sorts of misinformation happened. And uh, I got a call from Florida. Are you okay? Um, I didn't get any call from San Diego. <laughs> to mind um, the Christmas story. The shepherds in the field, the angels sang glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men of goodwill. And somebody must have heard that besides the shepherds. The choir of angels, it would make enough noise, you know, for an earthquake. Mm -hmm. 
And then you had the three wise men, or some say four wise men, who followed the star. Very few people knew about the birth of Jesus Christ. And look what's happened. You know, when we think of it in, in that way. Um, so, to understand, it takes faith to move beyond hearing and to be able to, to live, to live that faith. About um, a week ago, Saturday, I was in Washington, D.C. I was looking to talk to him, but he wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> and I was coming back, and I went up to see, I was dressed in my penguin suit like this. <laughs> And I went up to the desk of the American Airlines and they were talking and said, I have a very close connection. I fly from DC to Dallas and Dallas to Los Angeles. I said, it's very close. I said, oh no, you'll be fine, sir. You'll be fine. And uh, she said, look at this. And she showed me a medal of Pope Francis. And uh, she said, what do you think of him? I said, well, he's the Pope. <laughs> A very non-committal response. And she said, I'm so thrilled with him. She said, he's going to bring the church up to the modern world. And I'm thinking, who would want to be up to the modern world? When we think about it, being up to the modern world, you know, where it's okay to kill babies, where it's okay to destroy marriage, you know, everything is permissible. What Christ did, what this story of Christmas means, is just a, you know, a celebration. A celebration of you know, greed, in a sense, of giving, 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 shopping, Black Friday, you know, all of these things, Cyber Monday, you know, um, stuff like that. And it got me to thinking, you know, it's the opposite. Jesus said it in Mark uh, 16, Go and be my witnesses. Go and be my witnesses. You know, when we think about Christmas, that's the first coming of Jesus, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we need some more songs, I think. <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about that. It happened. And then the first coming, Jesus came in the flesh for our weakness, for our redemption. And in the second coming, Jesus will come in majesty and glory. And there's nothing we can do about that. His first coming and his second coming. Mm -hmm. There is a middle coming. A middle coming. And that's where we come in. Okay. The middle coming is when Jesus comes in spirit and in truth. Okay. He comes uh, in spirit and power. That's what Women's Christian Fellowship is all about. That's what we as church is all about. Basically, we speak about the church. But the church also has been guided by the spirit. So that middle journey, that middle coming is constant and the middle coming is a journey it's a journey toward the final coming from the first coming okay to the final we're empowered by the first coming but the middle journey has to be a journey that's lived from the heart it's lived from the heart with a deep sense of faith and commitment okay the, the faith that we have and again this comes from the scriptures and jesus says if anyone loves me he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him. That middle coming is constant. We cannot live without it. We cannot just base it on our history of the first coming and our hope for the final coming. There has to be a reality that is within that allows us to sort of come against us. Jesus said, you're in the world, but not of the world. To have that uh, um, motivation, that zeal, the zeal, all I want is to know Jesus Christ, St. Paul says. And knowing goes beyond the knowledge. Knowing goes beyond the knowledge. Knowing goes to who you are, 
in, in, in the very essence that you have. Just recently, um, one of our priests, uh, Father Mike Brooks, died of Alzheimer's. And uh, again, he was, he died in our house in San Dimas, or in Laverne. And it was terrible to watch him go down, okay? Because I lived with him for four years, and he didn't recognize me. That was just the beginning, but it got worse and worse and worse, okay? So much so that he didn't know how to go to the toilet at the end. But yet, the community that's there took care of him. They were very good to him. What's this for? You're, that's your food. What am I supposed to do with it? And they were with him when he died. A tremendous sense of the love that we have as sacred hearts. Okay. And speaking about that, we have our seminarian here with us today. Um, John Sachenko, who is studying uh, in our congregation in faraway Fiji. Okay. Uh, we are blessed with John. Uh, and there's a lot of scuttled up there. One of these days, John may be my superior. <laughs> so, uh, we have about nine seminarians, nine seminarians in Fiji. We've been blessed. Uh, we had none for a long time, and uh, now uh, we have got seminarians uh, from all different parts of the world, and there's a whole new vision opening up to the South Seas. <laughs> so, uh, but that, that middle journey is what's so important. Okay, what's so important, the middle journey. And that was in evidence as Father Brooks died. And speaking about a priest died, I would like to call to mind one of our faithful priests, Monsignor Fred Fjordic, you know, who has passed away about two years now. One. One. This morning, yeah. Oh, I killed him too early. <laughs> but he, he was very, very good to Women's Christian Fellowship. So, again, as we celebrate Christmas, think of that little journey, the journey that comes, um, you know, in spirit and in power, you know, taking the first coming of Jesus, not so much as some historical fact, but it's an ongoing presence. It's an ongoing presence that we would keep that here. And when you look, and I've attended the meetings of uh, Women's Christian Fellowship, it's very strong. That middle journey is really our hope. It's our hope to bring the world back up to the church, not, the, not vice versa. So again, uh, and it, it also says in the scriptures, I've hidden your words in my heart so that I may not sin against you. I've hidden your words in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Uh, this middle journey is not my idea. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of St. Bernard. St. Bernard, who spoke of the first and the final and the middle one, is where the spirit, that's the, the spirit and the bride. The spirit and the bride say, come, come and live in this middle journey, which has all the meaning for our life. More meaning than even the first coming and more meaning than the final coming. But it gives both first and final it gives them true meaning. <coughs> Thank you so much. My dear Lord and Savior Jesus, our Heavenly Father sent you into the world as a gift of love to everyone. Thank you for your presence with us and the gift of your divine love, which is manifest in our hearts through your Holy Spirit. In the season of gift-giving, Will you please enable me, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to give gifts not just purchased from the store, but also gifts that will glorify you. Allow me to be able to translate the gift of your presence in my heart into presents that are gifts of joy and love and mercy, presents that will fill someone's heart, gifts of love that will remain forever. Lord, let me give a forever gift to someone who is in need of it, a gift they can take to heaven with them. Let me give wisdom that comes from you, your word of power that will give life and encouragement and affirmation. 
Lord, let me offer the gift of knowledge that you were born to love and die for everyone. In this year of mercy, please enable me to extend mercy to everyone in need of your merciful love. Lord, help me give gifts of healing and heartfelt prayer like you gave. Only by your grace can I have the courage to give the gift of forgiveness that might set someone free from hurt. Please breathe your Holy Spirit into me to help me be the gift of love you want me to be for others. I offer this to you for your glory and as a special gift of love to you, my Lord Jesus. Amen. So here is Father Jerry Thompson. He's going to tell you his own story. And so welcome. Thank you for coming, Father. I was given 45 minutes to talk, so we don't run late for lunch, all right? So we've got a little timer going here. Uh, I was late this morning, and they were, the team was praying for us, but uh, I need your prayers right now, if you don't mind. Could you all extend your hands up towards me? I love to have people pray for me. It takes away a lot of the, the bad vibes and stuff. That are really I was asked to talk about talk about myself, and that's pretty much my most favorite topic. <laughs> and the reason it is is because I've been able to see the power of the devil working and also the power of God working. And I've realized over time that I have to learn to just go with the flow and see how things work because there's no power stronger than God's, even the devil's. And right now I'm, I'm sort of suffering. I've got a, I don't want your sympathy or anything like that, but I'm letting you know that the devil is attacking me right now. All right, he's attacking me with a migraine at this moment, and also uh, uh, working on a sore throat for the last three days. So uh, I don't think he really wanted to me to be here tonight or today. But that's okay. I'm here going with the flow. Because I know there's no power stronger than God's. Amen. Amen. And no matter what we go through in this part of our journey, as Father Mike was talking about, this part of our journey is not the, the end. It's only part of the journey to the end. And as we're a pilgrim church, we also want to realize that God has us on a journey with all the good things that happen in our lives and with all the bad things that happen in our lives and with all those boring in-between times in our lives where nothing good and nothing bad happens to us, the, the routine of life, that's all in God's plan for us. And all we have to do is look in the past in our lives and see how God is going to work in how God has worked in our lives and how he will work in our lives in the, in the future. And uh, one of the things I learned in the seminary, the first year I got there, I, I didn't have enough philosophy, so they made me go an extra year in the seminary to just learn to be a philosopher. And to, to it didn't help much, but it just, you know, got me thinking a little bit more. But one of the tasks they had me do the very first semester I was in the seminary was write a mini autobiography and basically taking all of my religious life, my secular life, my education, my travels, my home, my family, my genealogy, it into one document. And um, it really gave me some insight as to how my life unfolded in the spiritual, the, the intellectual, the family relationships, the, the journey. And 
I've been able to understand a little bit more about how God has opened in my own life uh, different doors and how other doors have closed because of it. And the first thing I remember is uh, when I was in um, San Bernardino. Okay, my father, basically to, to cut it short, because my dad was military, and we traveled most of our lives. And with that, we never really had a real anchor in our living situation. We always were moving from town to town, country to country, place to place. We didn't have a real church community. We didn't have a real secular community. The community we had was our family. The husband, my dad, my mom, and the uh, kids. And no matter how dysfunctional that family was. And, and, and truthfully, my family was, in a psychological standpoint, a little bit dysfunctional. And uh, we came to realize that, or I came to realize that even in that, God had a plan. Um, my parents were, were not really active practicing Catholics. They were what I call holiday Christians. We'd go to Mass midnight Sunday, you know, midnight Mass on Sunday of Christmas, and Christmas midnight Mass. And we'd go sometimes at Easter, sometimes at Easter, but mostly midnight Mass. And the reason for that was because that's when Santa Claus came. And we'd open our presents. But at, even at that time, I saw the, the, this was before Vatican II, and I saw the Latins, and it was wonderful. And I got this desire to become an altar server. And that sort of helped bring my parents to at least allow me to go to church on Sundays. And sometimes I'd even drag them to church. But, um, but in, in the whole time that I lived, I've lived in... San Bernardino area, where the tragedy happened this week. Uh, from there I lived in England for four years, Idaho for a year and a half, France for four years, Southern California, Northern California, Texas, Nevada, Turkey, and all sorts of different countries, you know, over this period of time. So there was no real foundation and firmness in, in the way I lived. Uh, I made my first Holy Communion in England, my confirmation in Idaho about a year later. Um, this was in a time when they didn't have confirmation much older, we were a lot younger. So I really didn't know anything about my faith. I really didn't know anything about the power of the Holy Spirit. And see, that's where we really gain the Holy Spirit is in our confirmation. That's when our confirmation is where we're supposed to Get our spirit taken, you know, and activated. Nobody ever taught me that. So I had to learn all this stuff as time progressed. And I tell my priest friends and stuff, I'm always about 10, 15 years behind everybody else in my journey. And so that puts me at about, I'm not even going to tell you how old that is. <laughs> but, um, so, I've learned and learned over time that um, that God works in His way and in His time. Not my time or anybody else's time, but in His time. And I have to, what I learned in the seminary is go with the flow. But it's still taken me 22 years as a priest to begin to learn to go with the flow because even in the 22 years I've been a priest, it's been a little difficult. But I was asked to talk more about my, my life in the Spirit. And we all know that, that the Spirit of God does work in us, but sometimes we don't see it. And sometimes we see it in a very powerful way. And my whole journey to priesthood has been a, a, a work in progress, but it was also a work planned out by the Spirit of God. Because had... I, with my parents not being really practicing Catholic, but me going to Midnight Mass, getting that instilled in me, the, the beauty of the Mass, not knowing what it was, the beauty of the Mass and the desire, that's the first time I heard the call to the priesthood. 
But I didn't know that was the Holy Spirit talking to me at that time because I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. We normally only talk about God the Father and God the Son in, in, in a lot of it. I call the Holy Spirit the forgotten person of the Trinity because we don't really talk a great deal about the Holy Spirit. And we don't talk about it because we're, we don't really know him as much as we know Jesus and know God the Father. But it's the Holy Spirit, like Father Barry was saying, that is operative today. It is that Spirit of God inside of us. It is God inside of us that is directing the world. And we can either choose to cooperate with the Spirit of God, or we can choose to fight the Spirit by how we choose to live our own lives. And uh, as soon as I, you know, I, I lived a very secular life, I'll tell you. And when I uh, got out of uh, high school, I needed to get away from this dysfunctional family I lived in. All right. Uh, we had uh, family members coming and going with the husbands, wives moving in. You know, it was just a mess. And um, and I needed to get away. So as soon as I was out of high school, I joined the military. This was during Vietnam. And um, it, it really helped, you know. It helped me to learn a little bit more responsibility in my life. And I learned how to, to do things different ways. Now, for instance, in order to get out of KP, you know, peeling potatoes and all of that type of stuff, they gave you the option. You can either go to KP or you can go to church. <laughs> Guess where I went? <laughs> I went to church. And... Um, I decided, okay, this is a great thing to do. I'm going to get involved with being an usher at church because you got to wear your dress blue uniforms and you get these little white things that really stand out. And it was really, really fun. And, uh, but that's all I did. I just went to Mass. And, and, and that was a reason was just to get out of doing something else. But even at that, God kept me in church a little bit. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be really super involved in something, but you have to be present there. See, and that's what I've learned too is that there's a lot of people when I'm preaching out there that really don't want to be at Mass. They have other things they want to do, but the Holy Spirit has put them in there for a reason. And that reason may not be until later that it unfolds. Some people are dragged tooth and nail to come to Mass on Sunday because it's something the church says you have to do. But even when you're dragged to Mass, God is working in that moment as well. And I believe that. Because all over my younger adult life, uh, I was searching for something, but I didn't know what it was. And um, uh, I got out of the military after four years. Thank goodness I didn't go to Vietnam. I had an older brother that did, but I didn't. And um, I got out of the military. I joined, uh, I went to, started uh, using the GI Bill to go to college part-time and go to a trade school. I became a hairstylist. <laughs> I became a hairstylist, guys, and I was good. I was really good. I, I was working up in Palace Verde. You know where that is? That's right. In the 1970s, I was charging $60 for a permanent in the 70s. A haircut for a woman was 27 bucks in the 70s. And I was booked solid four days a week. 
But I got so worldly. I was taking cruises all the time. You know, I was going to Vegas all the time. And, you know, I was just having a great time. And uh, uh, alcohol was pretty good at that time, too. And partying was really good. You know, you get around a bunch of hairstylists, you're going to party. You know, that's, that's what you do. And, um, but while I was there, um, I got in an automobile accident, a very serious one, that uh, I was with a friend, we were heading out in the valley to visit some other friends, and we were in a little, I can remember it as if it would happen yesterday, we were in an old Datsun B210, you know, those, one of those little, little Datsuns, and um, I was in the passenger seat and the, the guy I was with was driving and he's about six foot four and weighed about 300 pounds, all right? And I was just this little 5'8 and I was a lot skinnier then. Uh, uh, we were driving down the San Diego freeway right near, right past the airport near La Cienega, turn off on the 405 and it backs up there all the time. I didn't realize that. But as the car as the traffic backed up, the driver of my car slammed on his brakes to keep from hitting the other person. And at that time, I rolled up the window of my car because I was kind of leaning like this out the window, kind of casual and stuff like that. A gust of wind blows in, and I got really cold, so I rolled up the window. And as soon as I rolled up the window, I heard tires behind us screeching and Mercedes Benz rear-ended us. We slid, slid uh, and flipped over onto my door where I was kind of hanging out the window. Had that gust of wind not blown through the window and I get cold and roll it up, I would have been crushed on the concrete. Because I had the window tight enough to where the glass did not break. But had the window been left open, the first words out of my mouth was thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus, because, and then the next thing I said, get off of me, because <laughs> this guy was on top of me, you know, and, was, and I said, next thing I said was, this car's going to blow up, you know, you see those in the movies, you know, you can hit in the car, and I'm saying, get out of here, he's trying to open the driver's door, you know, he's got to push it up this way, he can't do it, and I said, roll down your window and climb out. He couldn't fit out that window. You know? <laughs> and so we eventually got out, and uh, I said, there had to be a guardian angel there watching over me, you know, or Jesus himself had to be there. Um, and my party life kind of went away from there. And the reason for that was I couldn't work for over a year. I ended up with uh, phlebitis in one of my legs. My back and my neck were shot. I couldn't sit for longer than 10 minutes. I couldn't stand for longer than 10 minutes. I couldn't lay for, a, for 10 minutes. I tried biofeedback. I tried, uh, I was with a chiropractor for almost two years, daily for a while, and then three times a week and five times a week. Anyway, I was a mess. But I had a lot of spare time on my hands because I couldn't work anymore. And um, I decided, well, I got to do something with it. What should I do? And I did not go back to the Catholic Church at that time. I joined a Pentecostal church, a very small Pentecostal church that was really filled with the spirit and very community oriented. And I got really, you know, involved as much as I could with that night. That's when I got that Protestant born again experience, which we call in our own journey a, an epiphany. But see, they call it a born again experience, but we know it as just an epiphany. And, uh, 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 and a more outpouring of the same spirit that's already in us. Um, and then I got involved with that place for about a year or so, 
And I wanted more. I was getting in, I was listening to the Bible, you know, these preaching. They, they don't really have the sacraments like we do, but they do know the word and they know how to preach it. And I, I got really on fire for the word of God. And then I wanted more. So I joined uh, a Protestant Bible college and I couldn't, uh, uh, I started going there and I was there for about a month, but still being in a lot of pain, I couldn't sit that long and I couldn't stand and I couldn't disrupt it. So I ended up, I ended up uh, having to drop out of the school because I just couldn't be that big of a distraction to everybody. And then, from there, the last night, I was pretty depressed having to leave this Bible study. And um, instead of driving my normal route home on the freeway to get back home, I decided to take surface streets. I don't know if you're familiar with that area, but I was driving down Studebaker Road, and which is a straight shot from where I was, the Bible College, into Long Beach, where I lived at the time. And... Uh, there was this guy hitchhiking. This guy had real long hair, he was wearing a robe, and he was barefoot. And this was about nine o'clock at night. And this was in the days where it was pretty safe to pick up hitchhikers. You don't do that today. But back then you did. And I, I rolled down the windows of the car and I stuck, you know, I stopped and he stuck his head in, where are you going? And I said, I'm just heading down Studebaker towards Long Beach. And he says, uh, I'll ride with you for a little bit. So uh, he got in the car and thank goodness I did roll down the windows. <laughs> because this guy probably had not bathed in maybe two years. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, I think uh, well, I'll get more into that in a minute, but I think there was a reason for that, too, is that was so I would remember that experience even more profoundly, <laughs> you know, because he uses our senses to draw us deeper into our relationship with him. He uses smell, he uses touch, he uses sight, he uses all of that stuff in order to draw us into the deeper mystery of who God is in our lives. So I think... Uh, this young man that I picked up uh, was put there for a purpose. Because as soon as, you know, I was pretty depressed having to drop out that night and I was driving home. He gets in and he didn't say a word. I just started, he says, you, no, he didn't say one word. He says, you look pretty depressed right now. <coughs> and I go, yeah, and then I pour it out to him. <laughs> you know, and I just let loose of all that I've been feeling, the auto accident, everything else that was going on and stuff like that, the searching and all that stuff, you know, and just, what am I doing with my life type thing? And so I just poured it all out to him. And then he looks at me and he says, okay, that's far enough. And he says, please pull over and let me off. And since it was night, nighttime, I pulled under a street light, a street light, and I let him out there. And he got out of the car, and I started to drive away, but I didn't yet. I wanted to make sure he was okay. And he stuck his head back in the window, the open window. And he looks at me and says, Jerry, keep studying. how he played a role in my conversion and coming back to the church. 
and his, the tape is Come to the Quiet, which is where he sings the psalms. And uh, I sat at home with my Bible in my lap, because now I'm no longer Catholic, right? <laughs> I, I never said that publicly, but I was more Bible-oriented. So I had my Bible, and I was actually reading it, and I had the music going on, and all of a sudden, this 15, 20 minute prayer ended up an hour. I was sitting still for an hour in my chair, not being in any pain at all. And I just kept doing that every night for an hour. Then one night, all of a sudden, with this music and the Bible going, I ended up praying for four hours, ending up on my knees, crying my eyes out. <coughs> And then a word of knowledge came to me. Go reconcile with the church. And I knew what that meant. Go to confession. <laughs> and I go, oh no. Oh no, it's been how many years since my last confession? And I did it. See, what I did was I trusted in that word of knowledge and then I acted on it. I drove 20 miles to a different church out of my neighborhood <laughs> and went to confession and I poured it all out. And the priest was really nice. He didn't condemn me, he didn't chastise me. He gave me a very small penance. I, I figured, you know, at least 25 groceries or something you know, for all I did in those years. But uh, uh, no, very, very cool. But then as time went on, uh, my prayer life was really taking off. I started going back to the Catholic Church daily. I, since I didn't work, you know, since I wasn't able to work yet, uh, I started going to Mass every single day of the week. And uh, I was getting words of knowledge, I was getting spiritual writing, all sorts of, my prayer life was so great. I was seeing my life 10, 15 minutes before it happened. I was having visions of what was gonna take place. I'll give you the greatest example of that. I was running a little late for church and I was driving over the Vincent Thomas Bridge. Uh, that's going into Long Beach. And uh, as I was pulling onto the bridge, you know the bridge kind of goes up and then down again. As I was going, I was kind of going a little fast, maybe about 60 miles an hour, you know, because I didn't want to be late. I still hadn't equated, you know, following the laws with the sin and all that stuff. So I hadn't quite equated that yet, so. Work in progress, right? You know? But the Lord took care of that because as it was pulling on the on the freeway, on the bridge, a word of knowledge came and slowed down. There's a police officer, and I saw it. The police officer on the bottom of the hill on the other side of the bridge. I saw the motorcycle, and I know it's a motorcycle. I saw the image in my mind, and the word came, slow down, there's a police officer. And as I got to the top of the hill and started going down, I slowed down. Sure enough, there was a motorcycle cop on the other side with his gun pointing at me. And I said, thank you, Lord. You know, but once you get touched by the Spirit and you're open to the Spirit, and you have a very good, solid prayer life, you can see the power of God working much more easily, much more easily. And um, that's, after that, that's when I got the call to become a priest. <laughs> because going to daily mass every day, uh, I didn't go into all the stuff in the altar serving and all that stuff because that, that we're running a little short of time on that. But that's when I got the call to become a priest. And then I went into the the uh, the path the priest that I went to confession to and I said you know 
I'm feeling the call to become a priest now. And he says, okay, well, you have to go down to the LA Archdiocese and talk to the vocation director at that time. I, mean, I didn't know discerning. I didn't know what discerning was, uh, whether I should be a diocesan priest or an order priest and anything like that. So I just did what, out of obedience, I did what he said. I went to talk to the vocation director at the LA Archdiocese. Um, and I went in there with the appointment and uh, he says, well, you're kind of old. <laughs> I, was, I was at that time, it was in the 80s and I was in my late 30s and um, they weren't set up yet for old people to enter the seminary. <laughs> so, um, they said they'd try it with a couple older guys putting, see I didn't have my bachelor's degree at that time. So I would have had to gone through the, the, the bachelor program and then the master's program. So that would have given me a total of nine years in college there. And they figured with me being as old as I am, I would make it. <laughs> so he says, okay, I'm gonna give you a test. You know, he didn't put it that way, but that's how I took it as a test. And it is that uh, you come back and see us when you get your bachelor's degree. And boy, did I was deflated, you know. I could barely work. I did end up going back to work. I was able to go back to work after all that prayer life. And I got physically healed during that. The biofeedback, none of that stuff worked, but the Lord healed me. And so I was able, after about a year and a half, to go back to work. And... Um, Then now I said, okay, now I have to go to work and now go to school to get a bachelor's degree. I happen to have had already two years, so I had an associate's, but only one year of that associate's would have been transferable to a, to a university. And uh, I said, okay, well, what do I do now? So one prayer it says, uh, uh, just check out the local college. So I went to Cal State Dominguez Hills and they had a, a Saturday program where I could carry 12, 13 years, units per month, going twice a, week, twice a week to school. And I figured I could do that, plus work, because I had managed to be so good at what I did, I only had to work four days a week as a hairstylist. So I had the time in that order. But then I didn't realize just how much time it would take to write all the papers. <laughs> you know, I could go to the class, that's all, I had the three hours for that. But all these other papers and all that stuff that I had to write was uh, really difficult. So I was in between haircuts, I was typing papers. <laughs> There's no such thing as a computer back then, you know, I got my first computer when I was in the seminary. But uh, I was trying to, and I was a lousy typist, so I'd have to tear it off to start again, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, but I managed to get through one semester, or one, one year, one year. So that actually gave me two years of college. I still had two more to go. But in the program I was in, it was going to take me another three years to get the two year degree, two more years. And I looked at myself and I said, I can't do this. My age, the, you know, in 30, hey, 30 some years old, you know, and I'm working and my age, trying to pay the bills and all that stuff. I couldn't, can't do this anymore. And I says, God, in prayer, I said, God, if you want this to happen, you're going to have to do something. I want this, but I just can't physically do it anymore. And you have to do something. And then in prayer he says, apply to every university you can think of. And okay, and I, I applied to maybe six or eight universities and I sent out my transcripts to all of them. I put in applications. And one of them called back and says, we can get you a bachelor's degree in one year. We will accept all of your units, everything you've um, you come to my university and you will have it in one year. It happened to be 30 miles from my parents' retirement home. So I moved in with them. <laughs> I 
I got rid of all my personal belongings. I shipped with my cat to my parents' house. I moved in with them and I went to school for nine months. And I got my bachelor's degree just like that. I applied, as soon as I had the diploma in my hand, I applied to the seminary. And uh, they said, come back and let's interview you. And I'm waiting and I went through the interview process. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting at my brother's house back in California. And nothing, and it was getting close to the, the time to start the seminary. And I said, are they ignoring me? You know, am I still too old for them? You know, I haven't heard one way or the other. Then my father calls from West Virginia. They sent the letter back to him. And they asked, Would you want me to read it to you? And I said, uh, uh, read it or send it to me. And I said, all right, go ahead and read it. And I read it over the phone and says I was accepted. I was in the seminary two months later. Aww. You know, and that's how God works. As long as we cooperate. But you know, at the time I was in the Pentecostal church, I really had this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I was praying in tongues a little bit, not much. I don't have the really the gift of tongues. I have no the baby tongues. <laughs> But God has given me the gift of healing. And I've, I've been using that because I've been healed so much of my own life in all sorts of different ways that he's allowing me to use that as part of my ministry too. So I travel around doing healing masses and stuff like that wherever and uh, wherever I'm asked. And um, many, many people have, have experienced the healing, healings and stuff. But it's, as long as we cooperate with the Spirit, the Spirit will just lead us in a direction that is right for us. And we don't know it at the time. We don't know it at the time that it's right for us. But we have to go through it. We have to go through the process. We have to make ourselves available. And when we do that, doors close and other doors open. The colleague saying, I couldn't have gotten three years and I ended up in one year. That was one door closing, another one opening up. All these things I was able to see in my reflections is how God has put all these human experiences to work. And see, uh, and it all started with that autobiography back in the seminary, it all started with that, being able to see my life coming before my eyes, written down in concrete form, and then begin to live it out even more and more. And the prayer life growing and growing and growing. And then using what God gives you. And see, it's all about action. It's all about participation. It's all about commitment. It's all about desire, and it's all about being open to doing what God wants us to do, and not what we want to do. And I think we have to do that by learning to go with the flow, because there's certain things that I wanted to do as a priest, there's certain things I wanted to do as a priest, but it never happened. And I have to learn to live with that, but I can rejoice that God has given me this other area to go into. And now, um, basically I've finally worked a way of doing whatever I want to do when I want to do it. <laughs> but I fought it for 20 years as a priest. I wanted to do certain things at certain times and I got shot down every time. You know, but now, I'm at a point now that the diocese, do what you want. You know, which is great, because now I do exactly what I feel God is calling me to do. And that's the healing ministry, the conferences, the talks. I do pilgrimages. I, do, I, I, I try to bring people in to, to know God more personally, more born-again experience of God. And, uh, and I love it. And, my, my journey, my spirituality is, is growing and changing too. I've had some very 
profound encounters with our Blessed Mother. Now I'll tell you, uh, we still have plenty of time. Um, what brought me back into the Catholic Church uh, from uh, leaving the Pentecostal Church is, you know, my mom, my mom and dad were pretty open to whatever I wanted to do, you know, because they weren't really churchgoers. So one year at Christmas time, I did take my mom to this Pentecostal church, you know, and as we were leaving, there was some women standing in the court. You know how women like to talk, right? <laughs> you know of a woman that likes to do that, right? <laughs> These women were talking really badly about our Blessed Mother. She's nobody. She's just a vessel for God. She's not anyone special. And I thought, come on, to myself. I didn't say it to them. I didn't want to get beat up. <laughs> but I said, you know, to, uh, I said, come on, she's the mother of God. She has to be somebody special. Why do they think she's nobody? And then I said, okay, this is where God is beginning to send me. So I got to learn more about my own feelings. And that's when I began to start learning about the church. And then getting the message to go back and reconcile with the church. It was because of our Blessed Mother that brought me back into the church. And then when I was in seminary, uh, I really, you know, I had a very profound prayer life before I entered the seminary. That I lost it all when I entered the seminary. <laughs> I just lost touch with God because I became academic. I was worried about my papers. I was worried about reading the assignments. I was worried about fitting into the seminary system. I was worried about this and worried about that. And uh, I had shared this with my spiritual director. And I said, you know, I, I, I lost that oomph, that spirit. I lost the, the power of prayer. And he says, how often do you go in front of the Blessed Sacrament and sit? And I said, well, not very often because I'm too busy. I'm too busy writing papers, getting them all done. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you, Jerry. You take your books with you to the, to the uh, Blessed Sacrament and just set them next to you. And then just sit there for an hour. If you feel like you need to pick up the books, pick them up. If you don't, don't. So I did, I took my textbooks and all that and sat in the next pew next to me and as I was sitting there, I didn't do it. All of a sudden, the hour just went away. It just went very quickly. And I did it the next day. It was really difficult, really difficult to sit there. You know, you're squirming and all that stuff. You know, you got all this stuff on your mind. Eventually, I got to a point where I was very calm again. I got all my papers done did everything I needed and still had plenty of time to pray that one hour. And that just helps me to recall the, the thing Jesus says, can't you spend at least one hour with me? And um, so my prayer life never got back to the same as it was at that time, but I realized why, because that was the time of contemplation. I'm not ordained to be a contemplative priest. I'm ordained to be a diocesan priest, working with the people. If I was ordained to be a hermit, I would probably have a lot more mystical experiences like I had at that time where I had nothing else. Or if I was a cloistered Benedict in some place, I'd have more of that spirit. But I was called at this time to be a diocesan priest, which is a, a priest of service. So I had to learn in my own spirituality how to bring God into the spirit during that time in, as I'm working. And you see, that's where God is. He's in the contact, too, with people. He's in the interactions with us. He's in our ordinary life. And um, so God works in each one of us in our own way. We have to be able to see it. We have to be able to see how God is working in our lives in order to put his gifts to work for others. And we have to go out and do it. 
And now each one of us has been given gifts to build up the kingdom of God, each one of us. You know what gifts you've been given. I know what gifts I've been given and I freely give them out. And you all know what gifts you've been given. You should also freely give them out because I think there was a theologian somewhere that says that when we do things, God compounds it. The natural and the supernatural, God compounds the grace and stuff. Well, something like that. I think it was Augustine or Aquinas, one of them. Grace, you know, grace built upon nature, you know. So, uh, right? Yeah, grace builds upon nature. And um, that's basically what we have to do. We have to do what we have to do and let God do the rest. And just be open and share. See, that's something else, too, that you need to do. Had I not shared that little part about my prayer life with my spiritual director and him challenged me to do something else, I would not have been able to, to really find more balance. So we have to have someone we can share with. We have to have someone to share our human experience with that is able to say to you and to me, this is where God is in this experience. Because sometimes we miss seeing God in a certain experience. But if we have an outside person able to do that, he can help us make sense of what's going on in our lives. And it's a journey. This whole part of life is a journey. The ultimate end is being in the kingdom of God with Jesus. But the way I look at it is this journey for me is to bring as many people with me as I can. And uh, yeah, I've got it in that. I'll bring as many people with me as I can because that's Jesus' commandment to go out into the world, baptize, and bring everyone with you. And we do that not so much by our works, but by our love and our presence. We do that by making ourselves available to them for what they need and not my own needs. And more, we're able to do that by putting God first, everyone else second, and yourself, myself, third and last. Because I always remember the last will be first. <laughs> I want to thank the Lord uh, for Father Jerry Thompson, for Father Michael Berry, and for Deacon for being here. Uh, as I said, there's that special gift to us as church through the gift of ordination. So thank you for being here with us.